So I'm going to speak about briefly for about 25 minutes or so about the importance of creating the study of anti-Semitism. So the importance of creating critical contemporary anti-Semitism studies. So basically, for those who don't know, you're uh, part of the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policies Summer Institute on Critical Anti-Semitism Studies. So basically, ISGAP was started in around 2003. We officially incorporated in 2005. And we started out, and I'm going to tell you my, my story, how I came to this very briefly. In the 1990s, I started reading about the Muslim Brotherhood. And I went to McGill University, the University of London, Oxford. I did a postdoc at the University de Montréal in a center dealing with ethnicity and society in a very nationalist university. And there was a, a blind spot. In the 19, I, I was living in Jerusalem, I was teaching at Ben-Gurion University, then later Tel Aviv University. And my area of specialization was looking at social theory and the perception of the other. How Western philosophy and social cultural policy perceived the other, constructed the other. And I looked at how this phenomenon was created from colonial times through to different policies to multiculturalism. And how basically European philosophy and political thought perceived the other and perceived uh, themselves. And how this was manifested into policy. I also became very interested in the processes of globalization and how neoliberalism, which I'll get to in my lecture, um, which, and structural adjustment of the 1980s, began a process in which the state was weakened, in a sense, because neoliberals, Thatcher, Reagan, uh, the free marketeers, thought that if the state had limited power, that more economic development would take place, that more capital would flow into developing countries in the third world, and that this would bring about economic development and more democratic principles. And what I was concerned about, and I worked on a book with my colleague uh, Femi Vaughn, who will be here next Thursday. So Femi and, I, Femi and I did a book on globalization and marginality. And what we were beginning to witness was that, that as this structural adjustment and neoliberalism was, was happening, there was more marginalization. And I was looking at sort of culture as a space of, um, of kind of protesting these changes, that culture became and identity became an important part of this changing socioeconomic and cultural process. And in 1997, I was part of an Israeli-Palestinian reconcil reconciliation group. I, my whole life, thanks to my grandparents and my parents, I've been very active on human rights issues. I don't want to bore you with details, but my grandfather, who was a refugee from Vienna, from Austria, uh, lived in northern Quebec, and he owned a general store as kind of the story of Jewish migrants. This is a common kind of occurrence. But he owned a store way north, about 500 miles north of Montreal in the Abitibi, in a place called Amos, a French town, colonized town. And he was the only Jewish person for 300 miles away with my grandmother and one of the few English-speaking people. And the Iroquois, the indigenous people, um, he became very friendly with them. And they wanted to open up a, they had a, the best salmon in the world is in that part of the world, and they wanted, my grandfather and his friend wanted to open up a, a fish cannery so the First Nations people, the Iroquois, can sell their fish. And to make a long story short, the Canadian government came to my grandfather and basically threatened him to be killed, that he had to stop. Because to empower the First Nations and the indigenous people of Canada is a long story of, of oppression. So he was sort of active on these issues and a strong, uh, active supporter of Israel and the Jewish community. So he, he was a speechwriter for Prime Minister John B Diefenbaker in the 1960s, one of the first um, champions of human rights and international law that came out of Canada. The policy of multiculturalism came out of Canada. So he, he was in this environment. And, I, and my father's family was also very active in politics 
socialist politics. So, that, you know, he was more conservative. The in-laws were socialists. There was lively ta table discussions. Um, and I was very active in the student struggle for Soviet Jewry, where basically students and housewives played a tremendous role in helping Soviet Jews to eventually be free to migrate and to live where they want. They were oppressed by the Soviet Union. So I was very active in that. And through, I was the president of Hillel, kind of active thanks to uh, this sort of family background. And through these issues, I also became very active in the anti-apartheid movement. I, I was the chairperson of the, International Sol the ANC International Solidarity Committee. So I worked with the leadership of the ANC. So I was very active on Jewish human rights issues, international human rights issues, and, and local kind of Canadian human rights issues. And very close to, uh, to the Innu people of Northern Labrador, I did a lot of work with them. Uh, there was a group of us that smuggled Ethiopian Jews to Canada before they were able to leave to Israel. It's a long story. Um, the first four refugees, Jewish refugees, to come to, to Montreal. Uh, my family took in, so there, there's a sort of awareness. Um, and you know, we, basically a group of students smuggled these people in because Canada had an agreement with Sudan and Ethiopia that if you offer a scholarship to a student, there was an obligation to bring them to Canada. They would get a visa automatically and these countries wanted to maintain good relations with Canada so they would allow the students to go. And basically, uh, my colleagues and I, this was before the internet and printers, we used to go around to our professor's office and basically have meetings with them and take some of their stationery, official McGill stationery when they weren't looking, and then we would offer scholarships to our brothers and sisters. So that's how we got some people out. Um, so I come from this background, living in Israel, I was part of an Israeli Palestinian uh, reconciliation group. We used to meet once a month for dinners. And this was in the 90s where there was, a, I think, a very strong hope for peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And we were part of a, a group of scholars that were trying to push for peace and for a two-state solution. And I remember I met a philosophy professor, a Palestinian philosophy professor, who was a very nice man, very cultured, very educated. And we would meet, and he would say the most bizarre things to my ears. He would say things about Jewish people that was uh, horrific. He would say things about how women um, should not be out in public, that they had to be escorted and accompanied in public spaces by an adult male member of their family. He would be saying things about the civil rights movement in the United States and that were anti-democratic. And we would argue uh, ferociously. But he was still a nice guy, but we would argue about these ideas. And then, around the third or fourth meeting, rather than fight with him, I said, you know, can you recommend some books? Because I don't understand where you're coming from. And when you study politics, I did social theory and politics and philosophy, in a short period of time, when you meet somebody, you can usually figure it out if they're right-wing or left-wing, religious, secular. You kind of, you know, you get a sense of where they're coming from. And this guy, I had no idea where he was coming from. So he, he gave me books. And he gave me the, the books of the founding fathers of the Muslim Brotherhood, Qutub and al -Banai. And I started to read. And I was, I was shocked for two reasons. One, I could not believe that the European anti-Semitism, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Nazi ideology, the, the stuff that justified removing the Jewish people from society was not just a part of the Muslim Brotherhood ideology, but was really a central core component. So learning about this, it was shocking that in the 1990s that this type of genocidal hatred was still not only existing, but was prevalent and growing in many countries in the world. And that I understood that this phenomenon, plus the neoliberal structural adjustments, policies that were being imposed on the Middle East by the G7 countries, and the dislocation from the state by many, many citizens. There was more and more marginalization, 
I thought that this was, in a sense, the perfect storm. So we began, I began to read uh, anything I could put my hands on that was in English or French from the Muslim Brotherhood, and started getting very uh, interested in this sort of the reemergence of anti-Semitism. I then moved to the United States, and as uh, some of you know, Elie Wiesel and Kofi Annan had the first uh, conference ever at the United Nations. The United Nations was built on the ashes of the Holocaust. The United Nations was created after the Holocaust. Europe and the world got together and said, never again, and they created the United Nations on the ashes of the Holocaust. And for the first time in 2003, thanks to Kofi Annan and Elie Wiesel, they created a major international conference on the reemergence of anti-Semitism. And I attended with a group of scholars, and to make a long story short, there was concern. I think a few of us began to see the, the, the danger of the reemergence of anti-Semitism, and we created ISGAP. And ISGAP was just an informal group of professors and scholars. Elie Wiesel was our honorary president, which was a great honor. You know, I knew him a bit growing up. He had a sister who also survived the Holocaust that lived in Montreal. So he used to come to my family's synagogue a few times a year and give lectures. So I kind of grew up seeing him a couple of times a year. So he became our honorary president, which was a great honor. And we started to do seminars, and then we, we took our seminar series to Yale. In 2006, we opened the first, and this is amazing, given the, the legacy and the space or the place of anti-Semitism in Western civilization, in Western civilization, deep in Western civilization, in 2006, we opened the first ever research center at a North American or a Western Hemisphere university dealing with anti-Semitism, and it was called YISA, the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Anti-Semitism. Some of my friends were scholars there. Professor Bassam Tibi, who will be speaking later, was a, a scholar with us there. We had seminar series, a graduate, a graduate fellowship program, we had a postdoc fellowship program, and we had senior professors come to our center. And it was a highly successful uh, project. And for five years, we were there. And that experience, it's a long, drawn-out story, which I won't get into. I want to be brief, but I want to kind of give you the background of where we're coming from. So the first research center ever dealing with contemporary anti-Semitism. And you'll see there's something, and you'll see this in the lectures in the, in the next two weeks, there's something um, non-threatening about dealing with dead Jews dealing with murdered Jews. There's something not threatening about that. We've come, we're coming to terms with our past. The church is coming to terms with it slowly. Um, European society is opening museums and erecting monuments and apologizing. So we're coming to terms. And uh, this reminds me of David Theo Goldberg's book on racism, that the liberal's bigness after the slavery, after the subjugation, after the genocide, the liberal bigness is when they apologize. They become big. So think about that. So the, what, what is the significance of these apologies? Particularly when, in Europe, once again, Jewish communities are under physical threat, and our people are moving out and leaving, and there's actually a sharp rise in, in violence, violence against Jewish people. So dealing with contemporary anti-Semitism is problematic, and we had it at Yale. So we were dealing with uh, political Islam, and political Islam on the radical left, there's the Red-Green Alliance. So even among liberal professors, there was this, uh, pro it's problematic to be dealing with the the study of anti-Semitism in spaces that were once colonized. Because to deal in spaces that were once colonized is somehow neo-imperialism or nationalism or you're defending Israel. So we had liberal scholars. We had liberal Jewish scholars, many of whom were, I would say, terrified, terrified that we were there because we posed a threat to, the equal, to their lives and to the equilibrium. So there's fear. 
among Jewish intellectuals and Jewish scholars at universities in the United States and certainly in Europe to engage these issues. And students and scholars and even tenured professors know that if you engage this issue, you could pay a price with your career. You can not get tenured, not get promoted. Um, we were at a conference last week where a student, a PhD student, came to me with tears in his eyes saying that he had to sign a BDS um, letter, petition, against DISGAP because if he didn't, his supervisor, who was on his committee to have a PhD, would be upset and he would not get his PhD. So he signed the letter and came to me in tears, ashamed of himself, but he wanted his PhD. Son, said my mother when I was knee high, you've need of clothes to cover you, but not a rag have I. There's, there's nothing in the house but a loaf end of rye and a harp with a woman's head that no one will buy. And she began to cry. That was in the early fall. When came the late fall, son, she said, the sight of you makes your mother's blood crawl. Little skinny shoulder blades sticking through your clothes and where you'll get a jacket from, God above knows. It's lucky for me, lad, that your dad is in the ground and can't see the way I let his son go around. And she made a queer sound. That was in the late fall, and when the winter came, I not a pair of breeches nor a coat to my name. I couldn't go to school or out of doors to play, and all the other little boys passed our way. Son, said my mother, come, come climb into my lap, and I'll shave your little bones while you take a nap. And oh, but we were silly for half an hour more, me with my long legs dragging on the floor. A rock, rock, rocking to a mother goose rhyme. Oh, but we were happy for half an hour's time. Men say uh, the, that was in the late fall, and when the winter came, I not a pair of breeches or a short blur or a coat to my name. A wind with a wolf's head howled about our door, and we burnt up the chairs, and we sat upon the floor. All that was left was the chair we couldn't break and the harp with the woman's head that no one would take for song or pity's sake. Men say the winter was bad that year. Fuel, uh, fuel was scarce and food was dear. So that is just a sample of the way that I sometimes attempted to engage students when I came to a classroom. Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem, Harp of, Harp, uh, Ballad of a Harp Weaver. And in that, she, of course, talks about a very dear relationship between mother and son. And she talks about poverty. And I, I suppose in some ways, the poem resonated with me because even though I ended up a middle class kid, and a kid who went off to the Ivy League and, and also to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, I started off in poverty. And I was a charter member of the Head Start program. I was in the first year in Lyndon Johnson's War and Poverty program. And I remember coming home very excitedly with my little book tucked under my my arms, and reading and reading and reading with my mother in a situation which was not unlike the situation which is painted for us in the Ballad of a Harp Weaver. So as I often tell students of mine, we tend to come to research projects not by accident and not by alphabetical order. When I was at Oxford, I studied affirmative action, but it wasn't because that was the first thing I saw in the dictionary. <laughs> I studied because it had deep meaning for me. So I engaged in comparative study. Charles and I were friends and attending the same seminars. And I was looking critically into issues of 
the idea of race, the social construction of race, the fabrication of race, and the implications of it in policy terms, in terms of education especially. So even though I was doing doctoral work, doing a cross-cultural analysis, looking at what is called affirmative action policy in the United States and what is sometimes called positive action in Britain when people like it and called positive discrimination in Britain when people don't, um, the core of my work was always in education. So I've been really very fortunate, so I'm particularly delighted to be the director of pedagogy for ISCAP. And I say that because my range, I've been very blessed in terms of the range of my instruction. I've spoken with parents several times and I've said, well, they asked me about my background in education. Well, what classes have I taught? What levels have I taught? And I can proudly say, well, my instruction spans pre-K to PhD. And, and I say that um, with a, a great deal of, of pride and humility because I learned so many different things by engaging in instruction at so many different levels. And just as a short example, and I, I will speak to you as colleagues who mostly teach as I was fortunate to do at the university level. My, my university level instruction experience is wildly different from my research and instruction and boots on the ground level with people like Maxine and others uh, when I was working in the K-12 system. And I think, I think that there may be something that we can learn from one another. Uh, for instance, when I was offered my position at Columbia, I was basically asked to consider my research areas of, of race, American government, politics, sociology, uh, international affairs, and to craft courses around those. So I taught American government politics, the politics of affirmative action. I created a course on the politics of censorship, and I taught uh, contemporary Western civilization, which is really kind of a, a political theory course, and the students at Columbia uh, jokingly referred to it as uh, from Plato to NATO. Um, <laughs> But you know, I, the interesting thing though is when I was offered the opposition to teach that course, I was fresh out of Oxford to teach those courses. And I had brilliant colleagues in my faculty, including Charles B. Hamilton, who wrote Black Power, and many others. And the chair of the department gave me no professional development. The professor said, hey, go teach this. Which courses do you want to teach? We need you to teach this, we'd like you to teach that, you have a choice of teaching this, and then you can create a couple of courses. So just give us your syllabi when you're done. No one said this is, this is Vygotsky, no one said this is Piaget, uh, no one said this is Augusta Mann, or this is Ruben Forestine, or this is Dewey. I had no explicit theoretical framework for what I did, except for what was in my head and my heart. And so what was in my head and heart was very much a love of the humanities. I studied language. I studied Spanish and French and a little bit of Russian. I loved literature. I've been a poet all my life. I come from a family of poets. And so when I first started teaching at Columbia, I started with what I loved. So it was very common for me to open a class with the recitation of a poem. And it got to be so well known in the university and the students so, I think, enjoyed it that they used to say, oh, here comes one of uh, Professor Long's poetry moments. So um, I mentioned that to say that it really in some ways connects to the work that we attempt to do at ISCAP. Uh, the work is deeply from you, from your head and your heart, and we encourage it to be interdisciplinary. So I think that one of the wonderful things I'd like to ask you to begin to think about, those of you who are currently university instructors uh, and who will be returning to your university context in order to implement courses, I think I'd like to ask you to contemplate what is your area of interest? What is your area of expertise? And how might that connect to some of the themes of our 12 days together here? 
And as a result of that, what new thing might you create? What new syllabus might you create that can be de delivered in your context? And this is wholly your own thing. As I said earlier yesterday, I'm here, my expertise is to facilitate your expertise. So my goal really is very much to ask you to begin to think, to reflect now, uh, and maybe keep a private journal and ask yourself, well, if I'm going to implement a course, uh, when I return to my context, what, what might that new course be given the thoughts that have been ignited here? Given the reflections that I have, the concerns, the problematica that I'm engaging with here. And make that own thing yours. And we'll have a chance next week to uh, meet in fellowship and to engage and to take a look at what you're, what you're developing. And then I will be here as a resource uh, to th help to think about different approaches to pedagogy that they didn't tell me about when I was a university instructor. I had to learn some of these things when, when I was um, doing professional development, when um, Maxine introduced me to Kane and Kane making connections about the brain, when other people from an, another group introduced me to Eric Jensen thinking with the brain in mind and, and a host of other wonderful resources so I'd like to share some of these with you when we, when, we, when we meet. And also, more than that, to hear from you in terms of the, the syllabi which you are beginning to create. Anti-Semitism hasn't been, and there remains a tool for ideologues across the political spectrum. What makes it unique compared to other prejudices is its appeal to right, left, center, and far beyond. To imperialists and revolutionaries, to theists and non-theists. This opposes, to say, enormous challenge in theory and in practice. It means that its victims, the Jews, as I say, are always fighting more than one. And the unique thing I think about anti-Semitism, the Jews, compared to other minorities faced by problems, have fewer reliable allies because of this vast repertoire that is available. Fewer reliable allies than other victim groups. And I think that's what some of the speakers are trying to say. Now, I'm going to divert to actually looking at some, th some ideas which I think are important for you to consider in, in explaining anti-Semitism. It underlies some of the things I've said. Um, uh, you know, sort of we've heard about it, it's the oldest ha hatred. Um, how various thinkers and disciplines have tried, I'll go quickly through it, to explain this. One of the newest ones is evolutionary biology and psychology, right? That's one of the newest things. Um, there's some guys called uh, Pinto and Bright um, who talk about, I think, deal with people who are fanatical, um, people like the Zionists, taking ideas from you. They don't actually, I'm using it to explain people like Rosenberg, Goebbels, Himmler, Streicher, for whom anti-Semitism is an obsession and a foundational belief almost beyond the faith. Um, and German, British-born German polymath like Houston Chamberlain, the first major intellectual to support Hitler, um, obsessed, and he was obsessed with Richard Wagner's redemptive anti-Semitism. Redeem the world, redeem Germany by getting the Jews out. He thought it would explain the world and assist the salvation of humanity. And the interesting thing about um, Wagner, by the way, he was regarded as a nut when he first did this in the 1850s. He said that and he had a problem with some rival composers. He said, we have to get German music should be pure, and we don't need any Jews writing music in Germany. And the Jewish composers should be banned, and there should be no Jews in the orchestras of Germany. In 1933, and then in 38 in Berlin, and then 38 in Vienna, they did that. Nobody believed 60, 70 years ago. There was madness. How could you ban certain music? How would you ban composers? Why would you get rid of the third violinist because he's the wrong whatever it is? I mean, it was disregarded, it's crazy. But somehow they persuaded people this was quite logical and normal. It's kind of a form of job discrimination, and obviously the fourth violinist thought it was a good idea as he moved up. But, you know, it, it's, it, it's still weird. Um, and this evolutionary biology tries to make sense of regarding this mass phenomenon in the population. And he, they, just as I said, genocide happens in wards. 
lots of prejudice um, comes up in insecure historical epochs where this hatred has psychological benefits, according even to the biologists today. It makes order out of chaos and takes decisions, makes decisions out of uncertainty. So um, I could go on about, you know, the, the evolution of the provided by brains and the biological structure. But certainly it says the formation of beliefs with people, a lot of people cannot discriminate very easily what belief is true and what is false. One of the ideas that we think we can. Um, beliefs are formed through the acquisition of information by a passive observation, the reception of meaningful signals sent by others. Um, and you've got people like Richard Dawkins who's talked about memes, you know, sort of the, the, the kind of genetic level of ideas operate in exactly the same way as in the, in the, in the biological world. Um, and information goes from mind to mind and spreads in the population. So let me give some example. Some beliefs are very difficult to eradicate, even when contrary evidence is presented. Um, examples. Large numbers of people still believe in intelligent design, right? Despite, you know, evolution. Young Earth creationists. The Earth is only a few thousand years old. Um, the climate is not changing. They're climate change deniers. Um, people who believe quite in, in alien abductions, right? You can't... Um, people who... These are adepts of what you might call political theories exactly the same. It's very difficult to get them out of it. Paradoxically, one of the studies that psychology has done of doomsday cults, right? Um, and some of the people, when they fail, become even more convinced and committed when they wake up alive and after the expected day of the end of the world or the abduction or whatever it is. And exactly the same way, conspiracy theories are very difficult to eradicate. People who are psychologically disposed to believe them, the more you tell them no, the more they think that's part of the conspiracy. Right? So they become even more, you know, intent in their thing. Um, let me quickly jump. Um, Well, I could talk about sociological and psychological explanations as well. So you've got this brain thing, which people find people are not naturally logical and consistent. They believe what they want to believe, and ideas spread very easily. Um, the, the dominant theme in explanations of anti-Semitism is the, what we call interactionist historical account of modern anti-Semitism. This was adopted by example for Hannah Arendt, um, Anti-Semitism is, a, in this theory, is, is, is the role of the Jew in modernity, which Charles goes on about, the development of the nation state, as well as particular aspects of Jewish history and functions in society. It's a largely a socio-economic account. The focus is on social conditions that produce anti-Semitism. The setbacks in the modernizing process, insecurities, upheavals, lead to revolutions, and postmodern and reactionary forces oppose this modernity. And this thesis really kind of favours what we might call the scapegoat explanation for anti-Semitism, a handmaiden for wider political agendas. The modernities, pseudosciences, social Darwinism and Marxism produced regimes that were basically not totally anti-Semitic for these reasons. Um, that's because bigoted politicians invent false images of Jews to serve their own purposes, according to this model. So we can invert the thesis, if you're looking for solutions, that, as you've heard already from some of the speakers here, prosperity and democracy are the prophylactic, right? Prosperous, democratic societies don't have this problem. And you get people like Wiss Wisser who suggests anti-Semitism is not inevitable, though some of the evolutionary biologists will say people like conspiracy theories. Um, not part of human nature, but a successful political ideology in this pre-modern interwar Europe, the contemporary Ar Arab world, societies in trouble, economic, social and other problems. That's what leads to anti-Semitism, the appeal. Um, and so democracy, a properly functioning economy is the answer. 
and the masses then will get proper redress for their, from their rulers rather than blaming others. And they'll stop kind of transferring their grievances and anger to the Jews or other minorities. And this correlation here is to the psychological projection concept, which Freud dealt with, right? Um, most experts place a great faith in education as the solution to the problem of prejudice. And that takes the form often as re-education, right? Awareness sessions, encounter groups, etc. But it comes back to the idea, do our ideas matter, right? Because you obviously believe these ideas matter. Or, the, you know, and the argument, do ideas throw up social conditions or do social conditions throw up ideas? Do they create the social environment, the ideas, or the social environment create the, the other way? It's an interaction model. Um, one of the points, again, is that, you know, coming back, and I think this is an important point, I'll deal with two others now. Um, racism and, nas and nastiness is, in the Western tradition, or most traditions, like crime, is generally associated with the lower orders, right? They're the people who are criminals. Um, conventional wisdom heard that the prejudice equals ignorance and can be fought and ultimately eradicated through education. Uh, more education begets enlightenment. But as I said, there's some very well-educated people. Um, Dr. Goebbels, Nazi minister of propaganda, was a Wunderkind, got a PhD in, lit in uh, literature from the University of Heidelberg at age 24. That takes some doing. Um, they weren't all thugs off the street. There were some, and they used them, but not all. If you look at Adam Smith, Scottish Enlightenment, um, moral philosopher, wealth of nations, right? An instructed and intelligent people are always more decent and orderly than an ignorant, stupid one. So that's a Western liberal, someone would say myth. Um, and this is the twin view of the idea that uh, the physicality and boorishness of the benighted is against the refinement and sophistication of the learned classes that are produced by Oxford University. Um, and they both relate to this theory of individual pathology and the mob's proclivity to violence. Now, there's undoubtedly, people do things in groups that they never do individually, right? But that doesn't mean that the only mob you get are just poor, uneducated people, right? Um, frustrated, inarticulate, alienated, angry simpleton is just opposed in this kind of idea with the balanced, mentally healthy scholars around the table. Right? But I would suggest to you it's a bit of a class prejudice um, rather than historical fact. Um, it's a liberal myth. The educated clergy in Europe were not always less cruel than the peasants and the serfs. Um, shopkeepers are not necessarily morally su superior to truck drivers. Um, sophisticated and cultured France is not necessarily better when it comes to the treatment of outsiders than America or Canada or someone like that, you know. Um, and of course, there was this great um, uh, disappointment with, with intellectuals in the 1930s. It started with Julian Bender, who said that uh, intellectuals was the function to defend eternal and disinterested values like justice and reason, um, but it didn't work. Uh, from D'Annunzio, who was the famous Italian poet and intellectual, who was the right-hand man of, uh, of Mussolini. Um, you've got Albert Speer, one of Germany's greatest intellectuals, great architect, um, his favorite uh, young man. Uh, you know, the intellectuals are really wrapped up in this kind of stuff. Um, uh, as they come back to Wagner and, and, and Liszt, um, uh, so you had this, and, and also that uh, you know the railway workers in uh, Amsterdam were the only people to go on strike against deportations of Jews. In Germany, the 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 universities were controlled by the Nazis before the streets. That happens to be the the, the thing. The German student Bund were the leading members of the of uh, leading phalanx of the, of the Nazi movement and the expulsion of Jewish students and professors in 1933-34, none of the faculty. There were no faculty strikes, there were no student strikes. Okay? And Martin Heidegger, 
one of the leading um, philosophers, young, another brilliant young man in Germany, actually wrote a, a uh, petition, a letter to the major uh, newspapers signed by 33 other professors, young professors, on the case for a national socialist university. Right? He was able to rehabilitate himself um, a little later, but the fact was he was a prominent Nazi. You know, he just didn't believe in killing too many people, so he got away. He sort of opted out when the war came a little bit. Um, he didn't believe in mass murder, but taking people's jobs was okay. Um, and so this, well, there was a surprisingly high proportion of university graduates against, among Nazi fanatics and psychopaths. And it's the same with every movement. An organized state discrimination or oppression or rest of it, the totalitarian states, is not done by people off the streets. It's done by careerist politicians, civil servants, all these kind of people. You know, you may say they go along with it, but actually, you know, they help it. You know, if you've ever seen that movie, the, the Vance Conference, they're all sitting around, they're all civil servants with PhDs. Um, Lastly, you know, so we can talk about the, the angst and anxiety and, and, and phobias that are involved in it. Um, Freud deals with this and, and it comes out in some of the mixture of these things. You should read the, the Frankfurt School, which brings together psychology and, and Marxist ideas and some of these prejudice studies, uh, psychoanalysis. They bring, put them all together. Um, but one of the things I think is very interesting, let me just deal with something which is, you know, the racial science was very attractive to, you know, Rosenberg's biological thinking. I mean, and that's another piece, Rosenberg, yeah. Rosenberg the, the Nazi race sign. He was the minister of racial science in Nazi Germany, Reich, Reich minister, I guess. And he had an institute, you know, and people measuring people's heads and showing these people are more superior to those people. It was a whole racial science. But the interesting thing about him is he had an obsession with sex, eugenics, and miscegenation. And that's an interesting part of it. And um, Nazi, if you go, and this comes up in a lot of uh, kind of prejudice things, Nazi stereotypes of Jewish men and women were very similar to racist descriptions, uh, obviously, in, in other groups, but black men and women. Feminized but rapacious men and uh, seductive and immoral females. And the Nazis did, uh, were worried about this. And that was one of the reasons why the Nuremberg Laws, Jewish, the first things they did, uh, apart from banning Jewish, uh, uh, getting rid of Jews, was Jews were not employed, Jewish households were not employed any maids in their households because this was, you've got to stop the sexual exploit. Two things, stop the ex sexual exploitation of, of German women, at the same time protect them from, uh, from Jewish men who was apparently harassing them on a vast scale. Um, and, and it comes out in very different ways. The Nazis were obsessed with sexuality. That's why if you've seen a lot of, you know, the Nazi regalia is very hot. There's certain groups that, you know, like the Nazi f boots and uh, stuff. Um, certain, uh, all right, well, I'm going to who they are, pedophiles and all these kind of things. But there were two groups of Nazis. There was the Strasser's brown shirts were infamous for their homosexuality. It's an interesting thing. They were, and based on the kind of homoerotic tendencies of Greece um, and an emphasis on male bonding, their rivals, the Nazi SS, which Himmler ran, had the opposite. They were obsessed with male patriarchy, uh, biological purity, and reproduction, large numbers. They wanted to do factory farming of white Aryan babies. Um, now, the most interesting thing, and you can find these same characteristics with ISIS and Boko Haram, for instance. There's similar kinds of obsession with sex and the rest of it. Um, sexual slavery big thing with the Nazis, all these kind of totalitarian groups, and then for the psychology of people who are attracted to it. The interesting thing, if you don't know, in 1934, they had the Night of the Long Knives, where the SS came in and they murdered um, all the um, SA leaders, and then um, persuaded Hitler to give a broadcast in which he said the SS, who had brought him to power, um, was being abolished because the, the SS the SA was being abolished, they were the storm treasures, they were the, the kind of lower order, they were the socialist part of nationalist socialism. And they were um, knocked off 
Um, and the, the argument was that all the SS leaders were found in bed with each other in a, in a castle. Of course, they were all shot, you know, but that was the argument. So they kind of, everything had a sexual Freudian dimension to it in, in much of the, in the, you know, Nazi stuff. And I think that's been underestimated. I mean, these are all coming back to the evolutionary biological stuff, you know. It, psychology, these, the kind of irrationality of people, the Freudian side and all this stuff. So I'll leave it there. I just hope it gives you some ideas, but you know, this is not a simple problem. How you teach this to 18-year-olds or whatever you want to do it is difficult, right? But uh, some of this kind of, you know, sort of is, uh, and the, these exposés, and this sort of little, might be interesting to them. <laughs>